Hello everybody and welcome to another One Piece video of mine. Today I'll be discussing the rank of Fleet Admiral. Like, what does that even mean? Or at least, what does it mean to me? So of course you can't really talk about that rank without talking about these two, Akainu and Sengoku. But I would also like to make the argument that I think Garp should also be included in this conversation because I do think that at one point in the past, though he never officially had that rank, I do think that Garp actually achieved Fleet Admiral level at one point in the past. But before I get into that, I'm just going to give you like a brief explanation of sorts. So this right here is essentially the root of a lot of things. Like this is essentially the, the core of a lot of online debates, a lot of flame wars, a lot of toxicity. If you really look at what people are discussing power scaling wise, you can pretty much trace that debate back to this thing right here, back to this hierarchy. And so this structure was introduced into the story by Oda around the end of the first half of One Piece, right before the beginning of the two-year time skip. Going into the new world, Oda said, I need kind of like a hierarchy, I need some kind of structure moving forward, and so this is what we got. Now, of course, there are some outliers to this, some anomalies. Like, for example, people don't know where to place Mihawk in this structure. Uh, they also don't know where Dragon fits in exactly. And then of course you have the everlasting Sanji versus Zoro debates floating around this whole thing as well. But for the most part, everything leads back to this. And so just keep this in mind because I'm gonna bring it back by the end of the video and I'll be placing Garp and Sengoku in this structure. Okay, so for starters, I think it's important to define what is meant by fleet admiral level. Like when I say fleet admiral level, I don't mean old retired Sengoku, even though old retired Sengoku is still a beast. And we know this because back in Dressrosa, when Sengoku was donating blood to Mancheri to be able to heal the people, the injured people of Dressrosa, Sengoku said that his donation would be enough to cure 10 heavily injured people. And later on, he actually said, okay, fine, I'll donate for 20 heavily injured people. And then the anime actually upped that number up to 100. So even in his old retired age, Sengoku is still pretty impressive. But that's not what I'm talking about here. When I say Fleet Admiral level, I'm talking about Prime Fleet Admiral level. I'm talking about what Akainu is currently, or what Sengoku was around the time that he got promoted from being an Admiral to being a fleet admiral, give or take two or three years after the promotion, right? That's what I'm talking about when I say fleet admiral level. All right, so 56 years ago, Garp, Sengoku, and Sudu join the Marines, and they start climbing up the ladder. All three of them go up the ranks until they reach vice admiral. That rank is where Garp and Sudu stay, and then Sengoku moves on to become admiral, and then ultimately moves on to become fleet admiral after that. Now the reason for why I put Garp around the same level as Sengoku is because that's the way that Oda has decided to portray the two of them. Their dynamic is that of two people that are placed around equal footing. It's always Garp and Sengoku, Garp and Sengoku, and they even have similarities in their history where both of them actually had a current admiral level character under their wing. In One Piece Chapter Zero, for example, we see that 27 years ago, Aokiji fell under Garp, whereas Kizaru was under Sengoku's authority. Also, both Garp and Sengoku took on the responsibility of keeping an eye on a kid that had nothing to do with them biologically. Sengoku kept an eye on Rocinante, whereas Garp took care of Ace. So you can kind of see the connection there. Also, we know that Garp was offered the position of Admiral on several occasions, but he turned it down. And he turned it down because that would place him under the authority of the Celestial Dragons. And so Garp just likes being like very free. He actually says in chapter zero that the rank of Vice Admiral is all he needs to do what he wants. So he was pretty happy with that position. However, because he was offered the rank of Admiral and turned it down, it does kind of get me to believe that if he had decided to continue going up the ladder, that Garp would have become an admiral and then later would have become a contender for the position of fleet admiral. Then again, I don't think Emu or Aim would have allowed Garp to become fleet admiral because he's a D. So I don't think Emu would have liked a D 
to be so high up in the Marines. In fact, the main reason for why Garp is allowed to get away with half the stuff he gets away with in the first place is because he's considered the hero of the Marines. Because he teamed up with another D, Goldie Roger, in order to be able to defeat another D, Rox D. Sebeck. So maybe Garp would have never been allowed to be considered a contender for the position of Fleet Admiral anyway, but the point of the matter is, is that Garp should be considered to be around the same level as Sengoku. That being said, the main indicator that points to Sengoku and Garp being around the same level during their prime actually comes from a statement from Goldie Roger himself. By the end of chapter 965, after Roger and his crew are done taking out a group of fodder marines, Roger tells them, at least bring Garp or Sengoku with you next time because you guys are no fun. So just based on that, you can tell that Roger is grouping Garp and Sengoku together, right? Because he says, or, bring Garp or Sengoku with you. So the or in that context kind of makes it seem as if Garp and Sengoku are interchangeable. Like, bring me one or the other. That's what Roger says in that chapter. The point that I'm trying to make here is that Sengoku is one of the most underrated characters in the entire series. He has a mythical type Zoan. As far as we know, mythical type Zoans have an extra, an added ability. Like we saw last chapter, Kaido being able to use his dragon fire to lift up an island. And we don't even know what Sengoku's extra ability was. I mean, it could be the shockwaves that he sends out, possibly, but we don't know. Also, I'm assuming that Sengoku got that devil fruit power once he became an admiral or once he started, you know, ascending up the ladder. So it does kind of get me to think like, gee, I wonder how strong Garp would have become had he decided to go up the ranks to, you know, get these positions and get a special Devil Fruit power of his own. Before the Marine Ford War starts, there's this very funny scene where this informant Marine goes up to Sengoku and he's like informing him about all different types of situations. Like, we have a problem with the prisoners and Impel down and a Celestial Dragon won't stop complaining. And then Sengoku's just like, shut up, shut up. Don't talk to me about any of that. Give that to the admirals. Let them handle it. I have to focus on prepping for a Yonko. By the way, where's Garp? Now, before the war actually gets underway, there's a very interesting statement from Sengoku where he says, don't be too sure that our forces will guarantee us victory against Whitebeard because that man has the power to destroy the world. So even with all the manpower that Sengoku had under him in that moment, he was still doubtful about being able to pull out a win against Whitebeard. Now, I'm not really sure if this statement includes the Shichibukai. Like, when he's talking about all our forces, does he include the Shichibukai in this as well? Like, one of the translations I read made it seem as if he was only talking about his military forces. So I'm pretty sure that, I mean, in that case, it would not include the Shichibukai because the Shichibukai technically aren't part of the military. Now, the fact that Sengoku declares that Whitebeard has the power to destroy the world is very interesting to me because I'm pretty sure that's how Sengoku remembers Prime Whitebeard to be. That's the image that Sengoku was left with after knowing about Whitebeard for so long. And so it's fascinating to me that at the time, Whitebeard was considered the strongest man and Sengoku is saying, this is because he has the power to destroy the world, right? And then, obviously, Whitebeard passes away, and up comes Kaido. And look at what Kaido says, right? Like, I don't care if this boring world gets destroyed. So, even though Whitebeard exercised a lot of restraint when it comes to his power, you know, because he never wanted to destroy the world, that was never his goal, Kaido, who comes right after him isn't as nice. He doesn't care. And so it's interesting to me that both of the Yonko who have had the label of the strongest or the title of the strongest attached to their name seem to also carry a reference or an implication about them being able to cause destruction at a global scale. It kind of gets me to wonder whether we'll see Kaido show some feats that whatever he ends up doing in Wano is so big that it actually ends up affecting other islands outside of Wano's jurisdiction. Now, the difficult part about Garp here is that we don't have a lot of individual feats for him. Like, we know that he teamed up with Sengoku against Shiki at Marineford, and that they were victorious. They were able to defeat Shiki. But the thing is, is that, well, first of all, that was a 2v1, so we can't really get an accurate measure for either Garp or Sengoku in that case. But also, it's important to remember that when fights happen in Marineford, 
the top tier Marines have to exercise a lot of restraint because they're technically protecting, defending their home base. They don't want Marine Ford to be destroyed. And we actually learn about this from two sources. The first one is Akainu when he tells Whitebeard, if I just let you go crazy here, you're going to destroy this entire island. And then later, Sengoku tells Blackbeard about how it's important that Marine Ford remain standing because it's a symbol of justice that's located in the middle of the world. And so it's important that it remain standing so that people have a symbol to look to. So again, that's why top tier Marines have to exercise some amount of restraint attack wise, all right? Not, not defense wise, attack wise. They have to show some restraint because they want to protect Marine Ford, which is why I really hope that the final fight of Akainu takes place outside of Marine Ford or, you know, outside of Marine headquarters. That way he doesn't worry about that and he can just go all out. Anyway, we also know that Monkey D. Garp fought Roger on multiple occasions. According to Roger himself, the two of them tried to kill each other many, many times, and then ultimately we know that both of them ended up teaming up with each other. I actually have a theory about why it needed to be Garp and Roger, the ones to take down Sebek specifically, and it actually links back to Teach. So we already know that there are some implications about Teach sort of being like a Sebek fanboy of sorts, right? Like he's following in Rox's footsteps. The last time we saw Teach, he was in the island where the Rock Pirates were formed. We also know that Blackbeard's ship is named Saber of Sebek, possibly named after Rox de Sebek. And Oda also revealed in an SBS that if Blackbeard wasn't a pirate, he would be an archaeologist. So he's definitely interested in uncovering the truth about the past, very much like Zebek. The reason he became such a threat for the world government was because he was delving into uncovering the truth about taboo subjects. You know, the Void Century and the ancient weapons, the Poneglyphs, all that stuff. And so it's quite possible that because Teach admired Zebek so much, Maybe he did some research and found out that one of the main reasons for why Zebek became this legendary pirate was because Zebek was the previous user of the Yami Yami no Mi. You know, because Blackbeard does say, the only reason I joined Whitebeard in the first place was because I wanted to get my hands on that fruit. That's the fruit I've been looking for, and I thought that if I joined Whitebeard, I would increase my odds of finding it. And it's interesting because in Bonero Island, Ace is having a conversation with Teach and he's like, you, you broke the golden rule. You killed Thatch, I can't let you go. And then Teach says, well, yeah, but I had no choice. You know, I've always wanted that fruit. And Thatch getting in the way of that was just bad luck because, and this is what Teach says, because that fruit chose me. So it's almost as if he's associating it with a sense of destiny, right? Inherited will from Zebek to himself. And that's why he thinks that he was destined to have that fruit. And so because of that, I think that what happened at God's Valley with Roger and Garp versus Rox is that Rox had the Yami Yami no Mi, the awakened Yami Yami no Mi. And so you know how the main speculation out there is that if you awaken a Logia devil fruit, you gain the power to control the weather or control the environment, right? Well, I think that Rox had the awakened Yami Yami no Mi. And the awakened Yami Yami no Mi allows you to create a vacuum. So similar to Law's Room, I think the awakened Yami Yami no Mi allows the user to create a space, a perimeter, that negates all Devil Fruit powers automatically. Like even if the user doesn't have contact with you, even if he doesn't touch you, if you step inside the perimeter, you lose your devil fruit powers. You can't use them. And so I feel like that kind of explains why it had to be Garp and Roger, the ones to defeat Sebek. Because if Sebek had that ability, you know, it, it would take a non-devil fruit user, like somebody who was really well versed in hockey, to be able to take rocks down. And so as far as we know, Roger and Garp didn't have or don't have devil fruit powers. I also think that that's why Oda made it very clear in Wano that just having basic armament hockey plus a devil fruit power is not going to be enough for Luffy and that he has to train in more advanced armament hockey techniques because if he's gonna fight Teach and Teach awakens his Yami Yami no Mi, 
his Devil Fruit power is going to be completely useless. So he has to get better at training up his hockey. And I think him meeting up with Shanks will actually help him. Shanks will actually help Luffy in learning more about, you know, more advanced level hockey techniques so that he can take on Teach by the end. And I'm also saying this because Oda has also made it very clear that he wants Luffy to surpass the previous generations. And so if Garp, if Luffy's grandfather, you know, with, with no double fruit, was able to team up with Roger to defeat Rocks, it would follow that Luffy would also have to surpass that feat without the help of his double fruit power. In fact, Oda has already sort of begun showing us how Luffy could kind of surpass Garp, in a sense, by having Luffy return Don Ching Zhao's pointy head to him in Dress Rosa. And speaking of Don Ching Zhao, we know that Garp was essentially able to one-shot him in a 1v1. Now, this fight actually took place 30 years ago, which actually came after the Rock's Pirates defeat. So this, this Garp right here that you see, this is happening eight years after God's Valley. So eight years after Garp and Roger teamed up against Rocks and defeated Rocks, this is what Garp was able to do. And we know it's a one shot because after this, Don Ching Zhao wakes up in his home country without his drill head. Now we don't know how strong Don Ching Zhao was at the time. And I also know that bounties do not equal power levels. But just to give you a very rough estimate, just to put things into perspective, Don Ching Zhao's bounty back then was 542 million. And so currently that puts him above every single supernova except for Luffy. But it also puts him below the bounties of characters that are Yonko commanders. So Don Ching Zhao right now is right at the border. He's right on the boundary of supernovas below him and Yonko commanders above him at least when it comes to bounties, right? And again, bounties do not equal power levels. But we do know that before his fight with Don Ching Zhao, Garp said that he destroyed eight mountains. And he did it casually because he says like they were my punching bags, essentially. And so I already talked about how I think Dragon was the one who trained Sabo to be able to know how to use the internal destruction Rio that we saw Sabo use in Dressrosa. And if Dragon knows the internal destruction Rio and taught it to Sabo, I think it's very likely that Garp also knows the internal destruction Rio, and that's what he used back in the day to destroy those eight mountains. Of course, we also know that Garp can hand throw cannonballs even faster than a cannon can, but perhaps Garp's most significant feat in recent history is how he was able to handle Marco in Marineford. In case you don't remember, Marco is on his way to the scaffold to save Ace. He has eyes on both Garp and Sengoku, so I'm not really sure what he was thinking because he clearly sees that he's headed right to them. And then of course, Garp jumps into the air and wham, just sends Marco flying into the ground with one punch. And so the thing is, is that we've never seen an Admiral level character be able to handle a first YC like that. I mean, the closest thing we have is Kizaru shooting his lasers through Marco at one point, but that's because Marco was severely, severely distracted because Whitebeard was in serious pain. At one point, Whitebeard feels sick, he grabs his chest and he collapses, kind of like kneels down on the floor and then Marco like is like, yo, I, I need to take care of him. And he's running towards him and then Kizaru's like, you're letting your guard down, Marco, so I'm gonna shoot you. So Kizaru had to catch Marco off guard to be able to do that to him. And then later on, Kizaru was able to shoot him again as well, but that's because Onigumo sneaks up on Marco and cuffs him with sea stone cuffs. And he's like, what is this? And he gets shot again by Kizaru. So again, on both occasions, it's, it's very obvious. It's made even more obvious in the manga that Kizaru had to catch Marco off guard to be able to hurt him. Whereas in the clash with Garp, Marco knows exactly where he's headed. He can see Garp. So it's basically like this clash that is inevitable, that is going to happen. And it's almost like a head to head kind of thing. And so actually the best way to understand where Garp and Sengoku are during Marineford is to look at what Blackbeard says about them. I'm going to give you a little known fact about Blackbeard. Blackbeard is actually really good 
at scaling people. And that's because he plans things out ahead of time. Blackbeard is the type of guy that never intentionally gets into a fight he knows he can't win. In Bonero Island, he tells Burgess and Van Ogre to stay away from Ace. Like, don't mess with this guy because you're not at his level yet. In Marineford, after Shanks arrives, Blackbeard is like, I already got what I wanted and we're not ready to fight you guys yet, so we're out. After Whole Cake, when the world was getting the news that Luffy had been declared the fifth Yonko, Blackbeard took that newspaper and he's like, nah, man, this is fake. This title ain't right. And then, of course, we know what happens to Luffy afterwards. And so with that in mind, after Sengoku uses his shockwave on Blackbeard and his crew, Teach says, all right, you're, you're pretty powerful, Sengoku. I'll give you that. But it's still not going to be enough to stop me from destroying this place. And by the way, this is after Blackbeard took damage from Whitebeard. All right. He got sliced up and then he also got a Gouda Gouda to the face. So he's still saying that. So that's kind of Blackbeard scaling Sengoku. And then later on, Garp shows up there as well. And he doesn't change his mindset. He just says, oh, you two are old. You're washed up. This is the end of your era. So again, this isn't really Garp and Sengoku at their prime. So he wasn't afraid of fighting Garp and Sengoku. But he was afraid of fighting Whitebeard. That's why he kind of came in late after Whitebeard had taken a lot of damage from the Marines, and then he was also afraid of fighting Shanks. So essentially, Teach was afraid of fighting well-established Yonko at that time. And so if we take all of the stuff that I just talked about, Garp and Sengoku, about how they've been portrayed to be around the same level, about how Roger kind of used their names interchangeably, about how we know that Sengoku as Fleet Admiral had authority over the admirals, how Blackbeard said during Marineford that both Garp and Sengoku were already past their prime, but also how Garp was able to handle Marco the way that he did, shooting him out of the sky with one punch, but also adding in the fact that Sengoku said that he wasn't sure if him and his forces would be enough to take down the Whitebeard pirates. With all of that together, I do think we have enough information to very comfortably place Marine Ford Arc level Garp and Marine Ford Arc level Sengoku in this hierarchy right here. And so with everything considered, this is where I would put Garp and Sengoku. And of course, we know because of everything that's happened in the story and everything that happened after Marine Ford that they were on their way down. So that's where I would place them during the Marine Ford War arc. And so, of course, we know that because of the time skip and because of the natural progression of time, that they're currently lower than that. But that's where I, I would have them during that arc. Now, when it comes to Fleet Admiral level, which to me means Prime Garp, Prime Sengoku, and current day Akainu, we don't have enough information about that yet, but we will. And we can get that information in different ways. We can get that either via a flashback about Garp or Sengoku. We can even get it via a mention about past Garp and past Sengoku, you know, about how they were in their prime. Or we can just wait for Akainu to have a bigger role in the story and start showing some feats. But either way, us getting that information is only a matter of time. Back in Fishman Island, Jinbei says that right after the war, that's when Sengoku resigned. And so that's when the tensions grew between Akainu and Aokiji. And so I think that that fight in Punk Hazard must have happened very, very close to the beginning of the time skip because if, if Sengoku resigned after the war, pretty close to the ending of the war, then I don't think that the Marines would be okay with not filling up the position of Fleet Admiral as soon as possible. And so we know that, obviously, Akainu not only defeated Aokiji, but he could have killed him, but he decided to show mercy, according to Jimbei. So if the Punk Hazard fight happened near the beginning of the two-year time skip, that still leaves Akainu with well over a year to get stronger. But those are just my thoughts. Please let me know yours in the comment section below. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked or appreciated some of the points that I brought up in this video, you know what to do. Thanks a bunch. Take care, guys. Bye.